Juicy dude. <gasps> Hey guys, welcome back to the Blood and Black Rum Podcast. I'm Ryan from ColdSploitation.com and I'm joined by my co-host Martin. How's it going? And uh, we are back today with an episode of our Remake Ween series. And also we have the uh, the privilege of having an October Friday the 13th this year. Which is quite fun for all of us uh, horror fanatics because not only do we get to celebrate Halloween very soon and so all of that all of those festivities are going on. But then we've also got Friday the 13th lodged right in there. Uh, a time when normal people probably are binging the Friday the 13th film series and people like me are watching the Friday the 13th TV series. Good. <laughs> Good. You can get, get uh, AMC and get their uh, Friday the 13th out this Friday. Early? Yeah. Rather than like, showing them all the way through Halloween? Yeah. Just leave Halloween to Halloween. I agree. I think that... I like Friday the 13th and all, but I don't really f- feel like it's a Halloween, uh, like close to Halloween movie. You know what I mean? Like if I'm going to pick something to watch during Halloween, like really that, like that last week before Halloween, it's probably not going to be Friday the 13th. It's going to be like trick or treat, the Halloween series, and then some other Halloween set films. I can watch Friday the 13th anytime. It doesn't need to be during Halloween. Batman v Superman. It's true. I was I, kidding about that. I, I thought you were. I, I looked it up, but uh, that was a joke that Martin said that Batman v Superman, the director's cut, takes place on Halloween night. I kind of, I, I almost believe too, because <laughs> Batman does have a tradition of taking place during Halloween, like the long Halloween. And then also in the, um, in uh, Batman and Robin, that also takes place on Halloween. Does it? Yeah. Hmm. No, I'm sorry, not Batman and Robin. Um, Batman, Batman Forever. Batman Forever takes place on Halloween. Um, because I recently did an article about it. I was, and I was gonna say I don't remember Batman. It's not a big part of it, but there is, there is a part of it where, uh, like the Joker and or no, not the Joker, the Riddler and um, like the Penguin or something. They like get together. Two Face. Two Face. That's it. That's what it is. I don't even know the premise because it's been so long since I've seen it. Uh, the. The Riddler and Two Face get together and they like have their costumes on, and they they like uh, knock on Bruce Wayne Manor. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and then, then there's could... like Alfred's giving out candy and stuff yeah, like that. The Riddler found out who Batman was. Yeah, exactly. It takes place on Halloween. I still say the greatest Halloween movie of all times: Cowboy Bebop. Yeah, yeah. Cowboy Bebop the movie. Um. So yeah, th- today for for remake Ween. We have the Friday the 13th remake from 2009, um, which... A film that the world just could not live without. We needed it. They needed it. And uh, so this was a long... I think this was a long time coming. Um, really had, had you know, uh, quite a bit of back and forth. If you look at the the um, credits, there was like four people credited to the storyline. And that's not the same four people that actually worked on the script for it. Um and it, so it was a long time coming, and uh, as you as we even see now, like with the Friday Thirteenth franchise, um, they, it can't really get its act together any at this point anymore. Like there's been announcements of you know Friday Thirteenth new f- sequel of the film, um, none of that has gotten off the ground, and for good reason. Two thousand nine will- really put the nail in the coffin. It made a shit ton of money though. It did, but I think that it had so many detractors to it. Um, and and yeah, I, but, but outside of the first film, it's not like the films are getting positive reviews. No, that's true. It was more so. of a money making scheme, sure. Um, and so, so it would make sense, you know, regardless of the reviews for the again, Transformers. It's been over ten years now. Good example. Still, still getting made because there's still people who are fucking going to see that shit. Yeah, I. Uh, I was one of the detractors of Friday the 13th, 2009. I, I saw it one time. Saw it. 
It was not in theaters. I saw it after the fact. Uh, really did not like it when I saw it the first time. And so I haven't I haven't been back since. Um, I never saw it because I had no not the slightest interest in seeing it at all. Well, you did this time because you, you thought it would be the perfect time to do it for the remake Ween series because we had Friday the 13th coming up on the, you know, the Friday that's right after when we normally release podcast episodes. So even though you're going to complain a lot about this film, you're the one that really decided on doing it. Well, you know, I'm a fool, so. And then we haven't even uh, touched on the Nightmare uh, on Elm Street remake, which is coming up. So you're going to have fun with that one, too, mm. I think. Um so, yeah, the 2009 Friday the 13th, um, there are people that do find the film to be somewhat fun, um, and I think part of that just stems from the fact that this this film is violent, it is gory, and it does really um, match, like, with the, the very generic plot points of what a Jason Voorhees film would be, in that Jason Voorhees kills a bunch of people. And in the more and more gruesome as they go along. And that's, I mean, if you're, if we're talking just straight up, what's the formula for a Friday the 13th film, then I guess this, this hits it. Would you agree? Yeah. <laughs> you sound, you say, you're you so very tentative at like, when you say that you're like, I don't want to say yeah, but I guess that's true. Yeah. No, it's. <laughs> It is, but I mean, it's it was, a thing. It, ha- it happened. <laughs> but like, like we, we talked about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's like, how can we take the original premise and make it totally cute? Yeah, it's literally, literally what they did. I mean, it's the same fucking director. Yeah, um, I mean, it's. I'm kind of surprised it's not the same writing team because it's li- literally the same plot from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Like horny kids want to smoke dope. Yeah, really. Yeah, in Texas, much. in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, they're going to see Skinner because it's the '70s. Yeah. Here it's they're at their friends camp uh camp on Crystal Lake and they're there to smoke doobies and drink beer. I feel like the. When they do that, so when they when they're taking the Friday the Thirteenth idea and trying to translate it to like two thousand nine, it's I think all I they're doing all they all they did was they added token characters. They had they got an Asian and a black character now because in the original it was just all white, pretty much. You got to yeah. diversify. They did they did they did their part on diversifying because God forbid any film today get made, um. That doesn't ha- hit certain beats like that because, uh, you know, because people get pissed off about, you know, certain things like that, you know, um, with like how, yeah, like, like, you know, with casting decisions, um, and which, which I don't, by the way, I don't think it's bad in this. Yeah. Cause it has no fucking bearing on it, no, no, but, it's, I mean, but it is something to know like, Oh, so, okay. They, they, they hit, they hit, you know, the spectrum when it comes to that. And then with this, like. Oh, uh, they can't just be kids out to drink and have sex. Yeah. Now they gotta smoke with doobies. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah, I mean, I think that that part of this is like trying to they're trying to recreate the formula for Friday the Thirteenth, but they're remembering it incorrectly. They're remembering it for all the wrong reasons. Like, um, when we look back at the original Friday the Thirteenth, was it really all about these people just wanting to get together and drink and smoke pot? No, no there was actually a reason for them to be there besides, like, their camp you know, the, I'm going to party. Their camp counselors trying to rebuild the camp. Now, and actually, you but, go at, in that one, you actually would act like those people because you'd think about it. These guys are volunteering their summers to go to a summer camp to give these kids a good time. You know, yeah, maybe they're going to have fun and have sex while they're there. But at the same time, they're good people. They've, they've got heart. And they're gonna re- redo this camp well, and make th- sure that those kids have fun for. Well, summer. not only that, as I, I brought up before on the podcast, we've talked about sl- you know covered the several different slasher films that we've covered on here. I think the whole premise and idea of like well, these kids are getting killed because they're having sex and drinking. It's like why? Like why? Why is that still a thing? Why is that still a trope? Well, no, what? Like again, like it's not again. We're not in the. Pu- puritanical days of yore where it's like don't have sex 
It's, Why do you think it's li- more- li- literally now? Like it's like fifth grade. It's like getting taught sex, and like most smart parents, are like it's like they you know think the care their kids going out and having sex. Like look, here's a condom. Here's whatever you know. Be smart for the love of God. Well, I don't think now like we're when we talk about slashers that it's totally in the puritanical sense. I think it's more in the titillating sense. Is like well, that's and, what people want to well, see. That and it's a trope. But my yeah. my point my point is I think it's I, overall I think it's like it's just stupid. Well, and I, I think too that the cautionary tale of the '80s was actually kind of overblown in the same sense that you you have some of the. Uh, loud people who are saying you know look at george romero's totally um political stance in uh, in and and uh sociological stance in dawn of the dead and that yeah sure i mean you can say in some ways that was a sociological perspective of people Consumerism. going back to you know stores because that's what they knew in their life and it was kind of ingrained in them but at the same time was it really or was it really just that a mall would be a cool setting um, I think we have that same sense with slasher films. There's been or there's been a lot of like books written about the psychological aspect of the slasher film. That it's a cautionary tale. That it's you know it's it's a, uh, a an attempt to stem the tide of like sexuality that was growing at that see, time. See, at the same time, like, look, I don't th- I don't buy that bullshit at all. I just think the right. whole the whole basis of it. I don't think they're doing it be- for those reasons. Like you know, like. I mean, obviously, the idea is prevalent because it's the whole reason it follows is a movie. Yeah, you know. But I mean, well, and and that's what I'm saying. But I mean, that... but but even still, I don't buy that. Like these films are basing like oh, you know, cautionary tales of underage drinking and sex. I just think it's a terrible trope. I just don't like the idea. That's why, like, I... why is Terminator such a great slasher film? It's there is no trope like that. It's yeah. Yeah. It's just... well, I I agree. I mean, I think in some ways that, um, like I I wasn't really saying that I I totally uh, no I know agree where, I... where this psychological reading of it, and I think those psychological readings have come later. So you have, you know, the films that kind of followed the same formulas, and th- the formula was more so used because it worked. So in, in when we talk about something like, um. In Halloween, for instance, where you have the the uh, teenage babysitter who is very shy and you know not into smoking or drinking or partying or having sex, and and she's the one that survives. Um, that made sense because she wasn't out and about doing those things. So obviously, she was not as easy to kill. Did you? You, and, you forgot her name? No. I'm just saying. I was just saying. I was using her as an example. I know, before. but you're like, I know. It's like you forget her name, but no, <laughs> you like you still. I'm just saying because you said it in such a roundabout way. Like, oh no, like oh the teenage she doesn't smoke or drink. It's like Ryan, are you? For, it's Lori Strode. Come on. No, I'm not you, forgetting. I just didn't. <laughs> um, but like with that, you know, she just wasn't in those, uh, you know, in those areas in that um. Pred- predicament i should say you know where where that would occur so it was harder to get to her um and so i think that some of those ideas of like when we had copycats you know of trying to figure out like well what's the next best holiday to use um <laughs> you you were kind of copying that formula so it became sort of a you know my brody valentine's gotta be canadians having sex in a mind shift. yeah and, and i think some of those ideas were copied uh people like seeing sex on screen they like nudity um so i think a lot of those those psychological readings came later where it was like well we see a pattern in this and so what's the what is the uh response psychologically to that like how should we read that and not and those don't always reflect the uh the way that a director or a writer meant to portray those things um in some ways, I think it, it's possible that those were – that was sort of a uh, – some of the intent, but it certainly wasn't the uh, the sole intent of the film, like to make it about don't have sex or you're going to get murdered. And I, so I've read a lot of, of books like about that stuff and none of them have really swayed me in one way or the other to think like, well, yeah, all of this was – consistently about sex well what a fool's errand those authors went on well yeah and exactly <laughs> i read one that said some things as ridiculous as Lori uses a key in the in the door so obviously that's a phallic yeah. symbol oh, and it's like everybody God. uses a key in a door i mean when they go there's not that's not <laughs> a phallic symbol that's an everyday object usage 
Um, so yeah, some, some things like that is, you know, really, or, or like carving a pumpkin and using a knife is a phallic symbol. Mm. No, it's a carving of a pumpkin. And I don't some, think John Carpenter was giving a shit. <laughs> right. That's what I'm saying. And even when we look back towards earlier slashers, like black Christmas, which we covered on here, she's pregnant. So she obviously was not, you know, um, not very careful. You know, the main, the main character in that was not very careful about her sexuality and still survives. So the, it wasn't always a thing. That's, see, saying. that kind, but that kind of, kind of, that fits more though with like the early seventies. Right. With like, you know, the sexual revolution. Yeah, that's true. So yeah. that fit, you know, that yeah, fits. Yeah, but I'm saying if, if we're talking about precursors to slasher films and Black Christmas being one of them, um, you know, you have, you, you don't have that formula starting there. So it's interesting. It's just an interesting idea of, of seeing how it has evolved and then how we've kind of interpreted patterns in it um, to be more psychological than perhaps they, they ever really were. And I think bringing it back to Friday the 13th, 2009, before we really go into our, our break and come back with some beer talk before we get into the film itself, um, I think that, you know, in in these cases, especially with remakes, you have, first of all, the intention to follow the pattern because that was what you, you did. You don't want it to be completely off base from the original film. And then at the same time, too, you got a lot of attractive women who are willing to take their tops off, so why not? go with that you know why why not put that on screen i think is the other um the makes other it, it idea that ma- marcus nispel has in this film it almost makes you think the casting for this film was literally like show us your tits no that one's lopsided next uh, those those are juicy you're in I, when, when when can we book you for this i film? would have to imagine that in some ways juliana uh guile or Gil, i'm not sure how you say it um, when she was being casted as Brie, I'm, I'm assuming that came up at least a little bit because how could you have that, that line? And th- that may have been perhaps, uh, a spontaneous reaction, <laughs> um, from Trent, Travis Van Winkle, but what a fucking, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but even so you, you definitely, you know, they, that probably wasn't far off. That's base, like that a there porn has to star's be some name. Sort of Travis Van Winkle, the Travis Van Winkle and his dinkle. Um, all right, let's take a break. Oh we'll no! Come back. Before, oh, yeah, we have some sad news. Sad, yes, sad news. Actually, we have some news all around because we've been talking about this a little bit, and I think you know, in the future, there's going to be a little bit of a morphing for this uh, for the podcast as we move into our hundred episodes. We want to try to do something a little bit different. It gets it stagnates when you do the same sequences over and over again. So for our next uh, 100, ep- 100 episodes, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. We're not there yet, so um, you know we're still working on it. But we do want to incorporate a news piece into some of our episodes. Maybe not all of them. There's not always news to do every single week. Um, and then also... Well, uh, there is some big news. There is some big news. And then also we want to incorporate a different kind of beer talk for our, our next episode. So um, and, and we're going to do a preview of that on today's episode. Yeah. Uh, but for in news... Go ahead and take it away. We have sad news. I don't like to make promises on this show, but I have made promises. I promise our kind listeners, when November comes, we were going to do the Death Wish remake. And unfortunately, we can't do that. And that is because due to the recent shootings in Las Vegas... The production company has decided to push it back to March of 2018. They felt like it might be tasteless to release a film that's basically about murdering uh, people willy nilly on the streets uh, with gu- highly a lot with guns. Might be tasteless. Which it's <laughs> one franchise after the first film is not tasteful, as we have covered. Right. On this it was, series, it was uh, in detail. A, a, it's like not a movement away from the more nuanced politic of, the, of original. Uh, the original film, and more just like, well, let's blow everybody away. That is bad. Yeah. <laughs> and but but this no, it, this literally does piss me off. Look, I understand, you know, and get that what happened in Vegas is a tragedy. You know, the nation is 
I hope still mourning it, mm-hmm. and not kind of moved on. But at the same time, why are you moving the film back? The film itself, especially with like, especially the fact that the message of the film is vigilantism is a good thing, right? Yeah, and you can take that as a viewer, you can take that as you will, because that is how the film, you know, the franchise portrays itself, mm-hmm. and that you know, armed citizens is a good thing, which you know, the gun lobby, you know, is the only thing that's going to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun, right? A lot of good that did. Um, but any... Not trying to get political here. But, no. But, at the same time, like, why are you moving it back? It, 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 again... When, when, <laughs> when, when will it matter if for, it's... You, when it comes out, if it still has that same idea? And not only that, for all we know, <laughs> there could be another shooting. Right, exactly. There's the same never, I mean, it, it, there hasn't really been a so, day without some sort of mass shooting. So, that is a very real concept that it there and when it's going to be released next time there may be something else bad that happened around that time and then you have to question really the thematic element of the film itself like if the people who made the film are like wow we, maybe we should it's, yeah. like, it's like maybe then maybe 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 not maybe the maybe your the uh the final theme of the film didn't really come out to be the the way you wanted it to be or way that you want most people to accept it um, yeah, it's, it's maybe there's maybe they have to reshoot shit, and they're like, yeah. and they're using it as an excuse to be like, it, it's possible. I mean, because I saw the trailer, I don't like to watch I'm, trailers because I'm like with the Last Jedi, I'm not going to watch a yeah. trailer. I want to go into that totally blank. Which I already have some friends that got pre-ordered IMAX tickets. Oh wow! Um, which one? I'm not going. I will. I'm not driving an hour to see a movie in IMAX, and two, I will never fucking pre-order a ticket for a movie. <laughs> I don't pre-order games. Are you fucking kidding yeah. me? I'm not, like, a month in advance booking my thing for, like, Star Wars. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll go and see a week later, then. Jesus, you know? Well, back back to the... But no, but, like, yeah, but getting it back onto, like, you know, the whole Death Wish thing, it's like, just, like, just, you know... I, I almost feel like they ha- maybe they are reshooting things so after watching the trailer i'm wondering I didn't... if they had some backlash to the trailer and they're concerned that a lot of people are not happy with the way and the the more comedic sort of like die hard late die hard sequel die hard uh way that this film looks because that's probably all bruce willis knows how to i do mean it really now. it does it looks like a uh like a, another diehard sequel really it uh, could be john mcclain it, it could be john it's McClane. not paul kersey that's you know taken out well he definitely doesn't have the bronson hair so or mustache yeah, yeah. it's literally fucking old man bruce willis yeah yeah definitely definitely uh not good news on that front and then also the other news too that we heard like back to back with that um is that the other film series that we've covered previously, the the Universal Dark Universe, uh, has pushed back its Bride of Frankenstein film as well. So that's not coming out. I think it was supposed to be February 2018 when it was coming out, and that's getting pushed back indefinitely right now um, for like script rewrites. Because and, and the thing is that the script has been done for a long time. I think I feel like the script has been done before. The mummy was completed, and now they're pushing it back. That's not a good sign for the dark universe at all. And and I don't. They've never. That's way like I'm not a fan of consistent sequels, like year after year. Like that's something that's kind of pissing me off with Star Wars. I do not want a Star Wars film every year. Yeah. As big of a Star Wars fan as I am, I do not want to see a fucking film every year. Well, there's never. It's just. Ne- it's never really a good thing to put so, yourself on a deadline like that. But at the like, same Let's time, out every year. Well, to say, but at the same time, with like Dark Universe, it's like five years in between each film. Yeah. And then it's long like long period of time. Then it's yeah. like yeah. That, then that's too long. You have <laughs> to you gonna... have to have like the perfect balance of like how you know it won't catch on if you like if you keep it <laughs> extended out like that. It's crazy, especially in the infancy. Like maybe well, later is like you're like yeah. running out of ideas. You can stretch it out, well, but like after the mummy, like probably within the two years, you want that sequel. Well, out, so even people are Bride still... of Frankenstein seemed like it was going to be a, like a long ways out for the dark universe compared to DC and Marvel and their franchises. Which they have a consistent 
like time frame for each of them. Well, they got like it all mapped out, perfectly. right? And and then you can, that just shows how little the Universal has put into the thought about like actually <laughs> getting these films to perform well by having a time frame, by having you know things thought out, thought through. So also not good news <laughs> on that front. So we, we probably won't be covering Bride of Frankenstein for a while either. We thought the Dark Universe was going to be something, and it, it certainly turned out to to be a uh, Flash, and very well could be dead. Pretty much out. Yeah, yeah, basically. <laughs> um, and then the other the one other thing that I wanted to bring up for news is just that uh, John Carpenter has, as you know, is going to be a producer on the new Halloween film for next October, and um, he said that. They're pretty much jettisoning, jettisoning everything besides the first Halloween film for the for this new film that's coming out. So he he calls it almost an alternative universe because pretty much everything else that happened in the other films is really non-existent in this new Halloween. I, I don't like. I still don't like that. I think if uh, again, I think not just because we both love Halloween too, because we both do love Halloween too. Right. I think it's got, adds enough to the lore and like. T- to like, can you can easily pick up right off eh, off after that, and it'd be if, totally fine. If if I had to guess, I'm I think that they probably were just uncomfortable with the um relationship between Laurie and Michael, so they wanted to get rid of that. They'll probably add it though. I mean, I, it's other a, than it's that, a, I don't really a, see a, the it, point. It's then. A, it's such a big like point throughout like well, the. But yeah, but other than that, I don't see the point of not picking up after Halloween two then. I, or the other reason is because they 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 want Michael to be immortal again, Mo- not immortal, but mortal, like he's you know just a regular human being, not some sort of like you know mythical monster that can come and and not die on every Halloween. So perhaps it was stretching the Limits. realism of having him be in two movies and then pra- basically get killed in both movies but not die. So maybe maybe they wanted to pick up with after the first film, you know, him being gone. That's a little bit more reasonable, I guess, to say that perhaps he was, you know, he just but, didn't but, get shot the way that we thought he not, did. Or it's not reasonable. It's been forty fucking years. Yeah. No. So I'm not. the man's gonna be like in his sixties and seventies. Well, I think that they're picking up literally after the film. That wouldn't make sense because Jamie Lee Curtis isn't it. That's true. I don't know how they'll do that, but maybe they'll have a young Laurie and she's they'll like, have an old. They'll have Jamie Lee Curtis, but she's not Laurie. I mean, it looks pretty modern. Did you see the photo? Yeah, the I, pro- know. The yeah pro- I know. The, I don't know the, what they're the, gonna do. The promo photo with Jamie Lee Curtis. Interesting. She's- Interesting ideas. I don't know. I guess we'll see you next year, which we will absolutely be going out to the theater to see. Mm. For sure, can't miss that. No, I won't. I, I'm actually. Not looking for like I, looking forward to is too strong of a phrase. I'd say cautiously optimistic. That's for it. yeah. Okay. Well, should we should we go right into our beer talk? Yeah, let's do it. So today we have something a little bit different than what we normally do because I'm pretty sure that we had both of these beers previously on the show. No, we have not had one. I think we have. We have not. No. Mm, okay. Because I we had I haven't bought this beer in mm. actually probably three two years now. Well, anyway, we're having a versus today, a little head-to-head competition between two beers of the same style, um, of the same state, from the same state. That's right. So we have it's a it's a Massachusetts Oktoberfest head-to-head. So in one corner we have the Sam Adams Oktoberfest, which we're in the orange orange trunks. Yeah, we're wearing the orange trunks, um, which. As you may have heard on the show before, is one of our favorite Oktoberfests. Is one of the first ones that I've had, and has always stuck near and dear to me in it my was, heart. Was was my first Oktoberfest. Yep. Uh, so it, it's that's always been a, a fan favorite for me. Although sometimes I do skip out on it in order to try different things. So I haven't. That had is it. true. That's why I haven't bought it in a couple yeah. of years. Yeah. It's like I, I generally it's do a, get it'll it on always tap. be it'll always be there. I do get it on tap if I see it. But that's the wrong kind of thinking, because as we know, Sam Adams are bastards. They, yeah, you know, <laughs> if there's any seasonal, they would replace it with like summer October festival. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> and then in the other corner, in the blue trunks, we have the Harpoon Oktoberfest. And interestingly, these guys aren't really that far apart either. 
both based out of uh, Boston, not not that far apart from each other. Years are close in establishments too. I think Sam Adams is eighty four. Yeah, I don't think I say in the bottle, but I'm pretty well, sure. Well, Harpoon says eighty six. So that's why I'm saying that. It's, you know, like, yeah, pretty close. I don't know. I don't really know. Exactly. I know it's early, I know it's early eighties for Sam Adams, but I can't. I think I'm pretty sure it's eighty four when the interesting. Jim Cook started brewing Boston Lager. So basically what we're talking about with these is we've tried them back to back to see how exactly they differ in terms of being a, you know, a German Mars in style. To see what makes them so so Oktoberfesty. What gives them that flavor and which one's better, really. So I'll let you take it away first because it was your idea. Yeah, so which one do you want to start with though? Well, I think we could talk. I think you should. We should do them side by side. Like basically, yeah. You talk about it side by side, and then I will. So we'll start with Harpoon, which I do think we have done Harpoon's Oktoberfest on here. Yeah, I think we did um, at some point last year. Maybe I'm not sure. Take a sip. Um, it it's got a multi sweetness to it but i wouldn't say it's overly sweet and it does have as you, um i wasn't able to kind of pinpoint it but as you said like a hop finish to it not like a pale ale or ipa hop to it but a hop character that you can pick up on that gives it a crisp finish makes it very easy to drink nice bodied beer very enjoyable I would say, uh, if I had to like kind of compare it to another Oktoberfest, I'd say kind of like Saranac's Oktoberfest, in that the malt, it, the malt characteristics and the hop characteristic of it are balanced, so you don't get a overly malty beer where you're like, where it's malt forward, like you're mainly just getting a malt, bready feel to it. On the other side, I would say Sam's. Oktoberfest, and we talked about it before. We haven't reviewed the beer on the podcast before, but we've talked about it because it's one of our favorite Oktoberfests. And how it's kind of unique in the sense that it's mu- compared to a lot of Oktoberfests, it's much more malt forward. It's very malty, very bready. The essence of fall, I would say. Like, it's almost like you're drinking pumpernickel bread, but it's not peppery. Like, it doesn't have, like, a rye ryeness to it. But it's, like, it's got that kind of heavy bread feeling to it and taste to it. I will say so, something I've never really picked up on before that I am picking up on now is I would say that heavy maltness to the beer that I think makes this uh, Sam's Oktoberfest different from others also makes it a sweeter beer to me. Because the hop presence in it isn't really... It's not there. It's very. It's negligible. You can't really pick up any on any hops in. It. So it's as with all that maltiness, this taste that you're getting from it. It's to me, by the end of it, you're getting that bready taste, and then at the end, a bread sweetness to it. That's how I would you know describe the two beers. Well, which one do you like better? Well, I want you to. Oh, okay. You want me to go first? I want because we have about to, it. Oh, yeah. Before I get like to say right. which one I like more, I want. All right. to, you, because we have differing opinions on like certain, yeah, certain aspects. Of the I do. I, I for whatever reason, I find the Harpoon Oktoberfest a little bit sweeter than I than the um, Sam Adams Oktoberfest. I don't really know why. I think it may have something to do with just how my taste buds are registering that there's that extra hop layer that Harpoon has rather than Sam's, which doesn't really have a hoppiness at all, and it's just, mostly the the finish is just very malty and bready. Um, and I will say that there is there is a tad bit of difference, especially when taking a sip of Sam's and then it going into Harpoon's, where I get a little bit more sweetness on it. Um, and I think that while both are good, I find that um, they definitely do have a different sort of take on the style. Whereas where Harpoon is um, less malty, little I feel, I feel like it's a little less malty and just a little bit more... Um, heavier on the hops to give it some a different finish really uh than sam's does so i i do agree though that i i find sam's to be a very good oktoberfest that's reminiscent of fall to me it just says very very (laughs) close to being fall like 
in a bottle. Without adding pumpkin to it. Yeah, exactly. Um, now, in comparison, this it's a very close battle for me. Um, it's re- it's actually really hard for me to decide specifically, like, an Oktoberfest that I like more because I do... I was actually very surprised upon trying both of these back-to-back how different you do get, you know... It's it's hard to notice the differences when you you have one for a while and, and then like you you have another one, you know, a few days later. It's like, oh yeah, they're all Oktoberfest, but they really do have their own distinctive taste to them. It's kind of interesting and it kind of made us think about, you know, what happens when we try two different of uh beers of the same style back to back like that because you don't really notice the nuances until you actually do it and have them back to back. Um so that's going to be something that we we try to do a little bit more moving forward, um, but in this case, I got to say the winner to me is Sam's Oktoberfest, and that's by a narrow margin. Um, I love all Oktoberfest, so I don't really think you can really do wrong by them. Um, I don't. There's one in particular I can name off the top of my head. That's a miserable Oktoberfest. Yinglings. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever really had that one, no, but oh, it's a uh... yeah. It's a bad beer. But I would say that these two, they both are really good styles. And just Sam Adams edges Harpoon out by just a little bit. And that could possibly be partially nostalgia. <laughs> I, I'm going to, I was thinking almost, I was going to say Harpoon at the beginning, but as I've been drinking it, I still say Sam's. Though I don't think it's my favorite Oktoberfest anymore. Ah. I think I think Saranax got the best Oktoberfest right now. They've outdone Sam's. It's not as malty. It's more like in Harpoon style. But I think it's balanced better, a little bit better and has more prominence in its malt and hop characteristic to it that makes it a more balanced, flavorful beer. Well, next time we'll have to do Sam versus uh, Saranac. See ya. But I, I would say, I mean... I, th- I would say probably Sam's is like a close second, though. But mm-hmm. I, I think... I would say it's the throne. But Harpoon's really good, too. And I had Brown's Oktoberfest this uh, week, too, and I, it was really good. Mm-hmm. I had, like, the same... Uh, Malty undertones. Like and... like a Harpoon. Nice. I do love our Oktoberfest. And Jack Jack's Abbey. <laughs> <laughs> you know, get on a little spree. There you go. Because it's only two weeks away, probably, before like the winter loggers start getting rolled out. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure very soon. And your old, may, they may even be out. And your old Fezzlewigs. I do like... I like winter beers, too. Close second. I agree, but I mean, like... Yeah. Not, not, as, not as much. I, w- I almost wish Sam's, when it comes to like their seasonal, that old Fezzlewig would be the... Dethrone the winter ale? I, I agree. I think the, the winter the, ale the, is, the, is the, the fine. Win, the winter lager is fine, but it's like the winteriness to it is so minute. I agree. That it's not, it's not like... I would rather see like an old Fezziwig become the new standard. <laughs> Ryan's sneezing right mm-hmm. now. Sorry about that. All right, uh, let's take a break. We will come back and talk about Friday the 13th from 2009. Stay with us. Hey there, neighbor. It's me, Head Librarian Gavin. I co-head librarian the Red Light Library, that erotic-only library off 2nd Street. Yeah, you know the one. Hey, did you know we're running a podcast now? That's right. And the thing is, we're reviewing the worst erotica we can find online for money, and I've been reading about a lot of weird things banging lately. Like, I could just sit here and tell you about the snowman, the leprechaun, the psychic Utah raptors that start an orgy the questionable lesbian with the applesauce scene that's really disgusting, and, oh, the Donald Trump. Or you could just listen yourself. Use your favorite podcatching app or look us up on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play. We're all over the place. The Red Light Library. Search it. You'll get us. Now for why I'm really here. Can I borrow your chainsaw again? We've tracked down an overdue book in someone's car, and we need to retrieve it with, shall we say, extreme measures. All right, guys, we're back with uh, Friday the 13th from 2009, directed by Marcus Nispel. Um, and produced by Michael Bay. Produced by Michael Bay. Uh, produced by Sean S. Cunningham, who, as you know, was uh, part of the first film. And um, No, I did not know that. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> that's pretty surprising, considering 
the massive amount of differences between this Friday the 13th and the original Friday the 13th. Well, to be fair, you can't remake the first one. Yes. That would be very difficult because you, you don't have that sense of surprise anymore. Well, I was going to say, no, the twist, the twist is gone. The twist of it's Mrs. Voorhees as, you know, Pamela Voorhees is the killer in the first film. Yep. I mean, you definitely... There's no, there's no way I can really think of off the top of my head where they could do that effectively. Uh, yeah, no, I don't... I mean, they... Everybody, it, every... It's... Well, it's, it's... It's it's common knowledge. There would have had to have been something even more surprising. So, like, a reveal that, yeah, there was, you know, Mrs. Voorhees, but then something else, too. You know? <laughs> it would have had to have been... Her lover! Right, yeah. Or something something crazy. Um, I don't even know... I don't know how you would do it at this point. I, I agree that... Doing the first one is really not I would in say, the best interest. I would say this is kind of like a a hybrid remake. Like it takes the ideas of one, two, and three. Yeah, because it's, you it's, you get parts of one. You you see at the beginning of this film, you see the end of one, where you know Pamela Voorhees is beheaded in in the in the final scene. Um, you see Baghead Jason. Mm-hmm. Um, you get parts of his little dungeon cabin thing. Yep. You, so you you get that. You also you know get regular masked Jason. His weed farm. <laughs> yeah, yes. So prevalent <laughs> in the other Friday the Thirteenth movies. Um. So and and that's about where the uh, the actual similarities to the other films uh, end because the, you can tell there are some um, throwbacks bow and arrow. Um, being one of them, you know, just weaponry that he uses. Yeah, but he they make him, like, with the bow and arrow in this, it's like he's fucking Robin Hood. Like, after, like, he shoots the one chick from, like, a mile away with that fucking, uh, you know, bow. That... He shoots the guy, actually. He shoots the, oh, yeah, the, the blonde yeah, the guy, the, the, guy. Owen Wilson, uh... Stand-in. Uh, wearing a fuck Christmas shirt. For whatever reason, no, 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 no. Like, there's a lot of things that were chosen in this film. It's like, why? Not only that, I expected faux. Um, it as I'm gonna, I'm stealing from Peter Rosenberg here from Hot 97, the Michael K show, because I'm gonna, because I'm, I'm, I am, I'm admitting it fully right now. But the the guy that plays Owen Wilson Light is literally he's Owen Wilson at Jace looking. All he needs to do is be like, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, wow, 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 wow. Do the Owen Wilson wow. Maybe also throw in some Matthew McConaughey's all right, all right, all right. Yeah. That's the kind of, you know, personality he gives off. Yeah. But No, like when like he fucking shoots him in the head with like the the bow, it's like almost like I was expecting like to hear like Robin Hood and Little John walking through the forest. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it's a throwback to to uh, their Friday Thirteenth films. As we've done, we did Friday Thirteenth parts uh, one through three for another podcast, um, the Jay's Movie Talk po- podcast. So we we've done them previously. So it's kind of fresh in our mind. I think that was like month, like two, two months ago. I think I want to say three. I think it was that far back. I, I don't know. It was it was a little ways back. Um, so it's pretty fresh in our mind and. I think what we're talking about with Friday the 13th is that it's a pseudo remake. It's one of those remakes. It's not really a remake. Could te- it could technically be a sequel. But eh. it, it could be. Although, mm. in this case, I think the biggest change is that Jason is not really the Jason that we know from the other Friday the 13th films. This is a fast-moving Jason. Which this I- is a goofy-looking Jason. I really don't... I- I'll say right now, I really don't like the design of this Jason. I will say I like the fact that he's like fast in this. Mm. Well, that's gonna be a sticking point between you and I. <laughs> like, I don't like fast moving zombies, but in this, I kind of like that he's more athletic. The man's built like a fucking, you know, a, yeah. ho- a horse, like a country farm boy. Yeah, that- Derek Mears. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Derek Mears he has should- really made a role out of just being big hulking man, <laughs> because that's what he is. And like, pretty, you know, he's just like uh- like when he throws like that axe like a hundred yards into that poor black man's spine. They should have been playing Hulk Hogan's Real American, like as he's like <laughs> hopping over a log, then grabbing the axe and throwing. Like that's what should have been like Real American. No, do you remember those commercials that are like? Real man, Jesus. Yes, so yeah, the Bud Light, yeah. like Bud Light. Should have done, done one of those because uh, today yeah. we salute you, Mister Hulking Serial Killer Man. Yeah, Mister Hulking Serial Killer Man. 
<laughs> yeah, Pat, Derek Mears has really definitely, and, and for good reason. I mean, the man is large and, and powerful and muscular, so why not, you know, just make a roll out of doing fucking large men and, and killers? If it was 1990, Vince McMahon would sign him instantly to yeah, the WWF. Seriously. Just on the fact alone, he's a... F- I mean, Derek Mears is, is like, the is really like Kane Hodder. And, and, and every other Jason that has done this role, I mean, you got to be a giant guy. And no, I like he, the fact... He really does pull it off, I think. I like the fact, though, that he's agile in this. Why not? Why can't Jason be agile? I don't know. I mean, I just find it a lot less menacing to see him, like, running around. Especially in, in the scenes where, like, he's running at the characters with a machete and kind of, you know, smashing through them like a football lineman or something like that. I, I don't know. I just... I mean... Maybe that's just my preference of, of like, these are the Jasons that I, I know and love, and, and that's not really one of them. It, it, it's almost like Dawn of the Dead, the remake. That's different, though. Zombies shouldn't be able to run. Well, well, yeah, I know, but I'm just saying, well, you could argue Jason shouldn't be able to run. He's a hulking man. I'm sure he's got a decent 40 time. <laughs> yeah, well. Uh, he's got some scouts from Alabama down there, like Nick, that- Sa- Nick Saban there with his plantation owner hat, being like, Yo, know, oh, that boy's coming to down to Alabama this year to play some football. So you're saying that one thing that I don't like about this film is like the one thing you do like about this film is that is that Jason is fast. Yeah, he, all he's missing is a football, like literally in the side. Like, <laughs> he's like, in his, yeah. and like, and like literally, like when he like hurtled over that stump, it's like, dude, it looks like Bo Jack. Like he's like, oh, it's great. It's like imagine you people who lived in the '80s and you know. That Bo can play, Bo Jackson does both baseball and football, and he fucking kills at both of them. That's what Jason is in this. He's Tecmo Bowl Bo Jackson. You cannot stop him. And it's great. Watching him hurtle over a stump, like grab an axe and throw it at somebody at a ridiculous step. It's great. I agree. Why, like, it's a- why, why, why is that, like... Why is that not acceptable? But him like silly like gr- like some chick in a sleeping bag and then like smashing her up against the tree. Why is that acceptable? No, I agree. I mean, I think that at least for what Friday the Thirteenth two thousand nine does right, it is at least fun in those moments where Jason is brutally murdering people. Um, I, I like a lot of the kills actually. I think that they're in some ways inventive and also throwbacks to the other films. Um, like you just tr- talked about the, the woman in the sleeping bag just getting smashed against the tree. Well, this one has a sleeping bag kill, except this time it's suspended over fire. And she's getting and, barbecued. And she's getting barbecued. And it's, it's actually a really fun scene because it's so brutal that in ridiculous, I mean, it's pretty ridiculous. At the same time, it's a lot of fun. Well, she just let her boyfriend fucking finish, you know? Yeah, that's right. That's true. That's the moral. It's not about sex. It's like, if you're going to have sex, you finish. That's yeah. You get to the finish line. Yeah. We don't like... Jason doesn't like quitters. They would have lived happily ever after if she let him get to the finish line. But she didn't. Yeah, because it seemed like mm-hmm. Jason was really trying to stop that from happening. Yeah. He was like, no, get distracted. Don't finish <laughs> so I can kill you. Um, yeah, no, I think the scenes you know, where Jason is actually doing his killings are the most fun out of this film. And that's really why a lot of people are actually watching Friday the 13th. Um, well, by this point, and by this and point, <laughs> and and I think they did a pretty good job with with uh, special effects and gore. Um, well, the the fault of this film is not its production. No, it's definitely not. I mean, they definitely a it's lot a of comp- attention was put like, into com- it. Competently filmed. I'm not saying it's gr- like the greatest looking, no. but, but again, it's got the budget. It's it's competently made. It's yeah, especially compared to like Texas Chainsaw Massacre's remake. Like this one looks a lot better. I agree. Yeah, it Visu- does. visually, visually looks a lot better. It, ha- it definitely makes more use of the environment. Um, but granted, I would say even Texas Chainsaw Massacre is made in the early two thousand, so it's still on that saw green tint shit look of mm-hmm. the early aughts. Where this is now, we're like getting to the. And uh, I guess how would you compare it to my Bloody Valentine's remake? Because we did that really early on in the podcast. Um, I don't even fuck. Uh, you don't remember it. It's so good. You don't remember it. Um, I remember not liking it. I, I, I think I remember I, the original. <laughs> I think again that this film looks better than that one as well, and I think that one, this one also has a mind in it. We can't forget that. 
you know, where Jason lives is kind of like in a minish area. It's like and a sewer. Yeah, and I think that they do a better job of just all around making this look like a camp and making it look like a outdoorsy area. Um, getting the lake in there. I it, I think it works. Um, that's, yeah, that's not the issue here. The issue really is the writing itself, right? I mean, I think that's probably your main concern. I'll uh, start with the first problem. As I said earlier... What is so hard about just making it about, like, again, like, if you're going to do the whole trope of teens and drinking and partying and having sex, just keep it at that. Why do we have to add now that they're out there to fucking find a magical weed farm? Yeah. Well, the weed, the weed in general is... Uh... Like, why is that a plot point? Why is it there? It's stupid. Just, like... Everybody like, thinks they're going to get rich if they find I know, a fucking... So, yeah, like... So there's not anyone hopping out of the, like in the back of the bushes being like, don't sell that weed. That's seven years in prison, you know, <laughs> minimum. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like even like small, like don't know. No. And yeah. I don't know where Crystal Lake's supposed to be, but those asshole teenagers um, had Jersey plates on their Jersey. Cadillac. Yeah. yeah. I, and I think New Jersey, like, like New York has really strict drug laws, especially for sellers. So it's like, yeah, you get rich, yeah, you get busted, 20 years minimum. Have fun, asshole. I mean, well, I think the biggest thing with the pot thing is that we have an opening scene after the whole, you know, Friday the 13th original montage montage of, of beheading Jason, which I actually like because that's straight out of Friday the 13th part two in that they just copied the entire last part of Friday the 13th and put it on Friday the 13th. I'm kind of surprised they didn't go for, like, the whole newsreel thing. Like, oh, yeah. It, to kind of give it, like, that faux, like, yeah. this is based out of it. They at least like, gave it, like, a contrasty black and white look, yeah. so, you know, stylistically. But um, but after that, you have, like, a 20-minute opening. opening scene sequence of just... Kids going to the camp and getting murdered. And not only that, it's like I'm guessing it's supposed to be kind of like a red herring type thing. Like, oh, you think? Yeah, I think. Like, it you is. think? Like, like you think they're supposed to be the group? And it's like, oh, 25 minutes in, it's like Friday the Thirteenth title card. It's like, it's like you're fooling nobody. What? If three people are killing like 10 minutes, it's like, yeah, obviously this isn't the main cast we're supposed to be following. Well, I think it's it's really like supposed to be you know in those original Friday Thirteenths, you obviously had the the opening scenes that were supposed to be getting you prepared. It's like the opening act at a, at a show, like getting you titillated and aroused for the rest of it. Like, Ooh, this looks like it's going to be good. Um, and it said just like that. That's how I say it. Every time, every time right, I see a good opening yeah, scene. Yeah. Right in the theater. And everyone, <laughs> everyone's looking at it like, shut the fuck up. Yeah. Yeah. They don't like me too much at the theater. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, but I I think that it was pro- it was meant to be like that, and so you you have it, and it keeps continuing, and at that point the the makers are hoping you're thinking like, well maybe this is the this is going on far longer than any normal opening montage would go. So you know you have that that expectation that perhaps this is our real cast. However, what I was gonna say is that that opening scene is really stuck on weed, right? You, the, the, all the characters are motivated by like, let's have weed, let's have sex, let's drink beer, uh, let's be the biggest douchebag bros this side of New Jersey, and that's fine and dandy for the opening act, right? I, I'm cool with that because those are not our real characters. Those are those are like, basically like standees, like styrofoam standees. Like, who please are, kill me. Basically, like, yeah. exactly. They're like asking for. It. They got neon signs above them. Like just, just kill me now. But then you get into the real meat of the film with your actual, um, your characters, the ones that you're supposed to be following for the next hour of the film. And, and the they same are the same fun. people. Yeah. They're, I mean, for the most part, I, they're a little bit more, I would say they're a little bit more likable than what we first no. meet. I, you no. You may not agree. There's only one one of that group that I would say is likable. Who's the, who's the one that's likable? The girl. The, that, I would disagree. Your, say, your, your red hair, the red herring. I would Final say, girl. though he's really weird, I would say the black guy's pretty likable as well, simply because he does go after his boy with no. a with a pan <laughs> of all things a in fondue, the house. A fondue pan. I don't know if it you, was a fondue or as, if it was a skillet. I, when I looked closer, it kind of looked like perhaps nah, it, it was, was like too, a skillet no, or something it was like that. Too like rounded at like the yeah, top or maybe it was like a saute pan or 
something like that. But no, because I will say he's probably the second no, best. Because he's he's fucking annoying. Well, I don't really know who masturbates in the middle of the living room to a Sears catalog, to a Sears after, catalog. Hitting a, after hitting a bong. Oh, my friends are, you know, fucking, I'm going to sit here in my friend's cabin and jack off. I guess at least... Never, never had that thought run, you know... No, I mean, I guess at least find the room next door to the people who are having sex and at least listen in. the bathroom or... Right? I mean, you know, at least get your kicks off on that. Or, yeah, find any other room (laughs) that's not open to windows and doors and the stairwell. Literally sitting in front of, like, the fucking uh, sliding door for, like, outside, (laughs) like... Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're coming back? What's up? Oh, he's a killer? Yeah, hold on. Oh, I gotta get, you know. Yeah, I've never, never I'm had al- that. I'm almost there. Hold on. Never. First of all, never really had that um feeling in someone in else's yard, house. Sort of- other house. You know, someone else's house. Not in my own, but in my, but in someone else's house to sit down on their couch and just go at it. And then again, if there was nothing. Like your, your mother-in-law's and like, you know what? Well, it's kind of weird too, because like what, what got him going in the first place? Because now he's got to find the Sears catalog to get off. We don't know. Like, like, now you're forcing yourself. That's not even going to be fun. Like, not, you're forcing yourself to get into the mood. It's not fun. Yeah, you're going to end up, you know, like, chafing by the by the time you're done, like, why did I do this? Exactly. There's going to be uh, come everywhere, and you're going to be like, why did I do it? Now I've got to clean it up <laughs> on the on this what stained hardwood floor that apparently costs a lot of money for Trent's family. Trent Van Winkle. Yeah, let's talk about... No, well, his <laughs> real name is Travis Van Winkle, but let's talk about Trent, because he's the biggest douche bro dude in the film. Well, everyone's got the fucking dude bro Keith Urban haircut of, like, you know... Yeah. I mean, even our, our main guy character, uh, Clay, who's played by Jared Padalecki, who had probably, at this point, just been starting out on Supernatural, the the TV show. Uh, I would th- I think that's probably one of his... Cause that's been going on for like thirteen years or something like that. So I think he probably w- had a WB show, um, CW, but same thing. Basically, yeah. Um, at that point, I think it still wasn't the WB. Maybe, yeah. I, don't know. I think that like he had just been starting out. So yes, he's got the uh, the Keith Urban haircut, and then you have Travis Van Winkle, which who- I, by the way, I don't even remember being a big thing ever. What? Fucking oh, that haircut. Yeah. You mean? I mean, now we've got like three people with them, and now that's what I'm saying. In this film, you have like all most of the guys with that haircut. It's like I don't remember. Not, not. I mean, Grant, you wouldn't see it around here. But I, I but know, I, I sure can't rock those curl. Those, but uh, but in locks. you know, I don't ever remember that being a thing in pop culture around the time. I mean, I feel like Jared Padalecki's always really had that hair. So I don't know who the fuck Jared Padalecki <laughs> is. Uh, so yeah, I mean, yeah. supernatural. Probably oh, well, best known for it. My bad for not keeping up on the CW shows. But with Travis Van Winkle, as you mentioned, and actually as mentioned to us by um, someone else, he does have the Tom Cruise thing going on. Oh my god, yeah. he's the, His character is essentially Tom Cruise and Ryan Phillips' douchebagginess. Like from like Cruel Intentions, or I know what you did last summer, like for Tom Cruise. Well, I mean, this is really turned up to an eleven. No, I, I agree. I, like the most outrageous douchebag bro, it, he could possibly be. Yeah, no, but if it's like something like I'm saying, so this is nineties. That's that's and so Ryan Fleet, that's him, and I know what you did last summer. Yeah, like basically, his, you know, with yeah the blonde. Like, I can't go. I can't go to jail. I, um, I know. Yeah, you have juicy titties. I mean, splendid titties. I'll say that I think in so in certain ways the unlikable characters are really intentional because we are supposed to want to watch these people get killed. Like if you're if you're watching a horror film and you are like in it for the gore, you're not really thinking like, well, I want to see this really nice person who's been helping the homeless at the soup kitchen <laughs> get, get murdered, right? I yeah, mean, but at the same time, like, one of the screw, like, maybe it doesn't work because it's turning the genre on its head, but one of Scream's benefits is the fact that everyone's likable. I agree. I don't really, I don't really, maybe, um, I mean, like I said, it probably doesn't fit because, it's, again, it's turning the genre on its head in that film. But but at the same time, I I I do agree with what you're saying though because 
I do not subscribe to the fact that we have to dislike everyone to see them murdered. I think that in some ways we get a lot more benefit out of actually liking it, them it and having it, it make an impact on you. Yeah, and, and instead of just being cannon fodder. Right. And I think that Friday the 13th, in a lot of ways, is um, very opposite that reaction. It really is more about the excess. It's about the rock songs. The, you know, the, the er, terrible. The, the 2000s rock songs. Terrible. Generic. Fuck, as I've said before, like, on this show, like, describing, like, early like, early and mid-2000s, even, like, late 2000s rock, the nadir of rock and roll. Yeah. Like, 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 oh, like, Jesus Christ, like. I think what you mean is super bad. <laughs> super bad rock. No, super bad had a great theme. No, not super, the movie, <laughs> but super bad. <laughs> Um, no, I know, but like, no, it's it's like it's just the most yeah. generic. No, I, it's even worse than like Ghost Shack is terribly like hilarious and out of place and terrible. Mudvayne is at least like mud like Mudvayne's like we're Mudvayne, we're Slipknot light. Yeah, this like I don't even know who the fuck it was in this. It's just, like <laughs> it's literally like it's generic some... Nickelback, Creed, Alter Bridge knockoff. You know, rocket like yeah. that makes me like wonder like who like who likes this. Yeah, I mean, like, so the, the film itself is all about the rock songs. It's all for about... Those, for those transition cuts, right. you know. Like, it's all it's all about the... The out of place Night Ranger. Like, why is Night Ranger Sister Christian in here? How many people come in to see this movie, especially if you're, like, slightly younger than us, or you're going to know who the... Like, yeah, if you're, like, two years younger than us, you're not going to know who the fuck Night Ranger is. Why not put an Ario Speedwagon song in there, too? While you're at it? I may enjoy li- hearing like a character sing Time for Me to Fly. No one else will, though. Yeah. You know, so, like... And it's all it's all about the, the violence, the gore, the stylishness of it all. And it's all about those boobies. And and th- that's yeah. really, like, the excess of it. So, like, that's what Friday the 13th is really concerned about. It's not really concerned about how serious you're actually taking the plot, where you're saying... This character was a really nice guy, seemed like a good person. I can't believe that Jason just up and stabbed him right through the face. You know what's got me thinking about when you mentioned them boobies? Probably has the most tit shots of any Friday the 13th film. Mm. It's I don't know. Off the top of my head, I'm probably going to say yes. The thing is, though, however, I, it's, it's kind of surprising. Like, with all the boobs in this, that, like, the, the MPAA, they were like, X. Nah. Because you know, well, no, because here's why. Because Friday, the special part about Friday the 13th Part 2 is there's Bush. Right. We get Bush. Mm -hmm. That would not fly today. We do get a little bit. It's very quick. But there is a, when, um. If it's like a split second, though, then. Yeah, when Juliana uh, Guile dismounts, uh, there's a quick shot of her. uh, And, and also, there's a pet, um, a hustler shot, too, from a magazine. Yeah, but those, like, quick. Yeah. At least in Friday the Thirteenth Part Two, it's like you know, like, bush, you know. It's kind that of those shots fly. It's more the penis shots. That no, really I know. Are, no, I agree. I understand. Uh, if it's if it's dick, it's an instant X. Which, and I, I don't, I don't get that. Just throw it in. I don't I know, care. I know. Well, people, dick are, don't bother me. Well, people are insecure and stupid. <laughs> but, but no, so like, but, but no, like, t- like I, th- I almost feel like, like if they could get away with like today, I think with like a book. But then again, it's kind of like how M- the MPAA is like stupid because in certain things like certain films like, you can get away with that other yeah. ones they're like no you can't do that you right can't... yeah I mean I, I think that in this case I don't know if it has the most out of a, a Friday the 13th film but, but it definitely th- they're yeah. the juiciest uh, I wouldn't agree because Debbie, <laughs> Debbie Sue Voorhees in uh, the stu- most stupendous in, fr- in Friday the 13th it does have some stupendous pendulous breasts <laughs> 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 Um, just <laughs> swaying back and like, right. like, like, like like a metronome like like they keep perfect like they keep time for you so like like mm-hmm. you could like if your friend you know friends fucking her and just, like, just, like <laughs> you could sit there with like a guitar and like okay keep a four, keep your tits at a four four let's go like, <laughs> yeah but in this case in this film almost every single female does show the rest so except Jenna uh her and now also um Clay's sister Whitney. She does not as well, well she's because they're the most the, they're the virginal ones. I, I still think Jenna's the most likable out of the whole. Yeah, probably she is because she's not a bitch. She's not yeah, a bitch. And it, she's not a bastard. Actually, though, why did she go with Trent at all then? If she's that likable, because clearly they do not match up in terms of personality. Because uh, Michael Bay hates women, and you're supposed <laughs> to know that women makes make stupid choices. 
in part. I'm going to go back to Trent, though, because as much as he is, like, an idiot, I actually really enjoy him in this film. I don't. Simply because it's he's so out- outlandishly ridiculous. You even said, though, towards the end, when he's going, when he has the balls to say when they're getting in the cop car and trying to get out of there when uh, Jason's chasing them, he says, come on, Jenna, let's get out of here and leave this asshole. So he after has, fucking, you know, yeah, after f- fucking another woman, he has the balls to say, like, even though they're in a, f- a car that can easily seat five. Well, as you know, because you play the Friday the 13th video game. And well, isn't it not fun to just fucking leave people behind? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah, <laughs> I would not say. See, I haven't bought it, but I would. I would. That would, to me, I would be laughing every time I did that. Like, <laughs> I like, mean, like somebody's like, "Help! Help!" Like, just speed off. Like, yeah, fuck you. Get a game get the is bone, a asshole. game is different, but in real life, that's a pretty prickish thing to do. <laughs> I can't imagine that for, for sure. Somebody coming around with a machete and you're like, well. <laughs> He'll, he'll get out of it. <laughs> Every man for himself. Yeah, seriously, I guess. Um, I think it's great. <laughs> yeah, no, but I mean, that's why I kind of do like, even though obviously I'm not supposed to like him, I do find that character fun. Um, but at the same time, I think what really does wear down the film is our, it's it's those characters, right? Those characters that are just unlikable um, the epitome of like people that you would see at a party and be like, well, I'm out of here. Uh, at least for I, us. I'm, I'm leaving. At least for us. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I was reading online. Um, the guy that plays the uh, Asian of the oh yeah Chewy um, Chewy Aaron New. They're like he put a great role. He did nothing. I he mean, did. He played every role you would see in like a stereotypical like stoner comedy of being basically like, stoned and drunk, and just be like, yeah, hey, yo. Yeah, I don't know why they would specifically pinpoint him. Laud him for his... I'm not saying he's bad, but again, like, doesn't. it's not like... Yeah, I wouldn't say he's bad, but I mean, he wouldn't say he stood out or anything. I mean, he just did things that were somewhat comical, but other than that, like, like I actually found Travis Van Winkle's portrayal of a ridiculous dude, dude, bro. dude bro to be a lot more resonant because even though it's obviously like cliched and and um exaggerated it's not really i've seen people like that i've you know i i have uh, encountered people like that so and and what i really like too is how focused on like cleanliness he is throughout the whole thing like cleaning up the the car like cleaning up the house like jesus christ like he invites all his like his fucking cadre of drunken stoner friends over who just want to drink and fuck and have a good time he's like don't get my dad's cabin messy and he's like why the fuck did you bring them then yeah you dumbass oh no you knocked my dad's chair over (laughs) and it's like it's like you're, you're fucking stupid um, like, if all you want to do is fuck stupendous juicy boobies, you should have just brought st- stupendous juicy boobies down to your cabin and yeah. have nothing but stupendous juicy boobies. Absolutely. How do you feel about that finale? Um, that kind of actually, in some ways, defies expectations because the final girl that we think is going to be the final girl is actually not the final girl. I mean, it would have been fine to have two. I don't know why you couldn't have Jenna, Whitney, and Clay survive. I kind of like the fact, though, that they did a little circumvent and uh, went around that. You you had the final girl. Because because obviously the, the first part of the film was a fake out. Then that last part of the film is a fake out as well. I think it's it's kind of clever. I, I don't know if it, it's necessarily, like, going to save the film. No, I mean, but it, it doesn't do anything. I mean, not, I don't feel... I, I don't have, like, any malice towards that either way. I think it would have been fine, though. Like, you could have three survivors. I don't think a slasher film should be beholden to the rule that there's only one or two survivors. True. Especially when you have, like, with this, like, fucking nine people. Yeah, I mean, more than that, really, than well, I, we it, actually see more people killed. Yeah. Um. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there's a lot of people. So, I mean, I, I don't understand, you know... Why, why I, I, you can't yeah. have three? Yeah. Yeah. Like, no, cause I like I said, because like I said, like Jenna do, like does nothing throughout this film that's offensive. Mm-hmm. She's literally the common sense of the group. I think like, 
Because, because as you were talking about with like Travis Van Winkle being dickbag McDouchebag, fucking you had in the beginning when they're at a convenience store and Jared Padalecki is like trying to show, you know, ask if he can have wanted posters put up for his sister. And uh, fucking Travis is just like, we're trying to buy things here. As he's listening to the guy like, hey, my sister's missing. Can I hold the poster up? And he's like, yeah, we're trying to buy things. We got to go. Come on. Let's go. Yeah. You know. And like, and Jenna's like, don't be an asshole. He's like, no, come on. Come on. This guy's dick. I want to buy my water and my combos. But this asshole here is fucking holding up the line. Even though they're the only people in the fucking store. Like. I mean, like, that, that's kind of, like, a point to, like, uh, where I'll agree with, like, okay, yeah, he's super douchebag, bro, so I get it. But at the same time, like, that's over the top. Yeah. Like, like, cause, like who, uh, who would ever do actually, that? actually do that? I mean, I've seen shit like that with working, guess, yeah. working retail, but at the same time, I, time I, as the cashier, I'd probably be like, shut the fuck up. You know, you pay me for your gas. You're not getting water. Get the hell out of here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um... I do, I kind of like the whole Jason getting caught in the wood chipper, though. That's kind of a nice change of pace. <laughs> Taken from Fargo. Yeah, a little something different. Because obviously we've had that, we had that wood chipper throughout the film. There's, a, it, there's the implication that it was going to be used. And uh, it eventually does. And it pulls Jason in. I, I kind of like that. I think it's a, um, another smart move. It, rather than just having Jason, you know, I get beheaded by a machete or you know dropped yeah, into the not, water. Yeah, but he's not mutilated by it. It just catches a chain that gets him caught up and he gets stabbed. Yeah, he gets stabbed and also part of his head is whacked away by the wood chipper. I think is what. Well, a lot of fucking good that did. Well, then they throw him in the water, so it kind of st- it, again it, it sets to, up that to, to what should have had the music from Titanic playing. Yes. <laughs> They're rolling her body, his body in there, and throwing the pit locket in there because, as we didn't mention, Whitney, the virginal soul survivor girl, Jason keeps her locked up in chains. Yeah. Because he, it reminds her, him of her mother. Yeah. Which, we didn't talk about yeah the locket part of it, and I am not a fan of the locket. I feel like that's a very small trinket to be had. But not only that, why would he keep her though? Yeah. Just because he looks like her, he knows it's not her. Right, he knows, he it's knows not what her. is he, clearly if he didn't know that it was if he didn't know that it was not her, he wouldn't have her chained up. So yeah, it, it's a I don't buy Jason being like stupid. No. Or like, you know, he may be deformed, but he's not he's not retarded. I, that's why because, I, because you as you <clears throat> see the things he like does and how he outsmarts, you know, people. It's not like it's not like he's stupid. That's why I wish that they had brought the sweater back, because the sweater at least makes a little bit more sense. Um, if she looks like her mom, his mom, and she's wearing the sweater, and psychologically he's kind of messed up, he might, in the dark, think that it's her, right? But the locket really doesn't do anything. Like, anybody can have a locket. Why does that signify that that's got to be his mom? Or, or reminiscent of his mom so he keeps her around it just doesn't there's not really anything that resonates there that that makes sense for the part i i, I think it'd be great if they made it with like the whole part when he comes down and, like drags a dead body and all of that if it was like more, like more like married with children he's al bundy and she's like pagan because like the way he's just like acting like you don't ever appreciate anything i do yeah, you know like yeah. and like he's like getting ready to like hit her or something and she's like jason and he's like all right fine <laughs> Fucking go kill more people, mom. God. Yeah, I just, I just want to play Sega. I just wish that yeah that that uh, the whole chain up thing w- made a little bit more sense because in, in this case it really doesn't. It, it, yeah, how it doesn't like, she's been sense. down there for like two months. Three months, yeah. Is he letting her off the chain to poop and shit? Must what's he feeding no, her? What's he feeding? Like, is he like cooking dinner? And she's like, he's like, here, mom, eat something. And she's like. He's like, why do you not love me, mom? You know. Yeah, I don't know what she's because eating. I don't know where she's poo pooing. Michael Bay didn't think these things. <laughs> out. Um, anything else that you have to talk about before we head into ratings? I think we pr- I, we covered everything that I wanted to talk about. That girl didn't swim out of that boat. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, no. No, she definitely does not. She does not swim out of the way of the boat. That's that's a speeding boat. Like hey. That's a funny scene all around because, uh, first of all, I don't think getting hit in the head by a boat speeding at you is really just going to leave you a little bit concussed. I'm kind of this... I'm kind of surprised it didn't have her get like mutilated by the propeller. Uh, yeah, I mean... That's something I always like... Get hit by the boat and then, like, mutilated by the propeller. You know, and... I do think that they went with the whole machete in the head thing because then they could pull her up out of the water and have her boobs one last time. Uh, so you got, like, the violence in the boobs. But, yeah, I, for, I feel like in that scenario, probably what would have happened is she got hit by the boat knocked really out fucking hard. Knocked at out least and knocked out unconscious or not really, dead. like, torn off her head. <laughs> And then she got chopped up by the propeller after. It probably would have been not as bad of a death, actually, because it would have been over before she knew it, and she wouldn't have been, had that fear of, of dying after. So, I don't know. Yeah, but that, that scene is ridiculous. <laughs> Pretty pr- ridiculously crazy. Yeah, it would be great if they played the Curb Your theme after, like, you know. Curb Your Enthusiasm theme. After, like, like, hey, like, the poof, dun, 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 dun. Yeah, and it would have been, yeah, it would have been funny if Jason was standing around like, what? Cause yeah, cause yeah, cause he was standing around watching, so it's like, oh, you know, like done. <laughs> yeah, cause it would have taken a kill away from him. Yeah, he didn't get to enjoy that. All right, so uh, what would you give Friday the Thirteenth, two thousand nine? Cause I know that you were, uh, when we were watching it, you were kind of hating on it. So what would you, what would you give it now that we've had a chance to talk about it? Out of, mm, out of, um, out of. 10 weed plants. What, what would you give Friday the 13th, 2009? 3 out of 10. I thought you were going to go a little higher than that after we've talked about it, kind of had some discussion about it. No? This is a fucking miserable film. I didn't really get to give him like my full thing, kind of breaking down the film, but I can't now because this is my part now. I get to go solo. This film is miserable. It's only 97 minutes long. It feels like it's fucking forever. None of the characters, except one girl in this film, is likable. They're all your stereotypical douchebag college like frat boy sorority girls that you just like. I can't. I can't wait for these people to die. And I don't. When I see a slasher film, it's not what I'm angling for. Like, yeah, it's nice to see like inventive and cool ways to kill people, but at the same time, it's a film. It's supposed to tell a story, not just be about effects and kills. So it better have an engaging plot and enga- engaging characters that you can get behind. This film has none, none of that. It's absolutely dreadful. The score, which we didn't even talk about, is fucking boring, dull, overplayed, and filled with generic the nadir of rock and roll of the 2000s. The only person in this that I find likable is Jason. I think David Muir, Derek Muir, sorry, as big hulking lumberjack offensive line Jason in here, Jason in here who can run sprint after people. It's the only thing that's good about it. That's like the one positive thing about this. I actually like the fact he can run sprint because I love seeing Jason sprint and hop and over a stump and throw a fucking axe at somebody. I would have loved to see him like stiff arm somebody like he's a Heisman trophy. But other than that, this film is this film is bad. You take the original premise of the f- first film and the second film too with it being based on the camp and you have to fucking 2000sify it with like it's not good enough that they're just kids wanting to have sex and drink and party. They got to be potheads and stereotypical potheads and like dude, Lucy the bong Bull, blah, 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 blah. It's stupid. And the fact that these college kids are drinking Bud Heavy. We didn't even talk about that. We should have drank that for this be- uh, podcast. No college kid drinks fucking Bud Heavy. Old men buy Bud Heavy. Old men who are hunting down in Alabama drink Budweiser. They'd be drinking Bud Light. Or something of the kind. Keystone, actually probably Keystone White. They would not be drinking Bud Heavy. That's the biggest flaw in this film. Yeah. I'm offended by it. Well, Trent's rich, so maybe he bought the Bud Heavy. At least, like, the the first crew, they were drinking PBR. That makes sense. 
those hipster douchebag pothead stoner, stoner kids would be like, Pabst Blue Ribbon's the best beer in the world. Because I saw Clint Eastwood in Gran Torino. And that's what Clint drank. Clint drank Pabst. As he was hating fucking Asian people. This movie's bad. It's boring. It's dull. And the sad thing is, again, it's a competently made film. It looks... it. You can tell that care was put into the production of it. It's just a shame the cast, the story, the pacing, the soundtrack is terrible. And some of the kills are inventive, but at the same time, I can't be bothered to really care. Because there, there's nothing to care about. Well, um... I'm gonna, I I gotta disagree a little bit here. Uh, I'd probably give it a five and a half oh, out wow. of ten. I called that. <laughs> um, then, this is I, the first film in a while we had we haven't yeah agreed. we haven't really agreed on. We've it. agreed yeah. for quite a while now. And this is... I mean, the first time that I saw this film, I really didn't like it. I was pretty vehemently, vehemently against it. Um, the second time I'm watching it, I can kind of appreciate the 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 more um, fun aspect to it that you know. May, perhaps it's the the season, the the spirit of the season that I'm that we're in. But uh, it doesn't count. You said you don't even consider this a Halloween film. No, it doesn't. But I'm 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 in the mood. I'm in, I'm in the the spirit of Halloween. So um, maybe maybe it's that. But I I definitely I had more fun with it this time around. Um, I could appreciate that it was kind of going more ex- towards exaggeration. Um, that there were scenarios that were obviously ridiculous, but still. Within the realm of like a slasher film, uh, it's not that I'm not fine. With, I'm, uh, I'm whoa, sorry, whoa, 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 I know whoa. this is my time to speak well, here. You, know, you had your time, so I get my time to say I my know. thing, and then you can you can comment on it afterwards. But let me finish. <laughs> um, no, but I, I think that <laughs> I think that the uh, the the kills are 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 pretty good. I think, uh, pra- you know, pretty practical effects, um, and I, there's some definitely some creativity to it. In terms of how they do the kills, uh, banking off of previous films in the series, um, and uh, some throwbacks to those films, so I like that a lot, and um, I like the boobies, um, so I'm I'm cool with that. And uh, but other than that, I do think that there are some major flaws. One being the script. I don't really think it's written that well. Even if we aren't supposed to like the characters, I still don't think the script is written very well. Um, I'm not a fan of the the fast running Jason. Uh, I don't really like that that much, um, and I think that pr- I I, I well I I appreciate what they were trying to do with the 25 minute opening. <laughs> um, I don't really think that was super necessary. I think it could have been a lot faster than that and not waste a lot of the time that we could have spent probably meeting the characters a little bit more. Should have um, watched a Bond film on how to do an opening. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's really where I get my five and a half is that I could appreciate the fun uh, aspect of it, but I also was hoping for a little bit more and, and it doesn't really meet my requirements for a Friday the 13th movie in terms of what I think of as like classic Friday the 13th films. So now you can speak. I can't even remember what I was about to rant. Good. On. That's right. You, you already got your rant in. Um, you're way too generous. On I don't know. I, 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 I'm saying – so, well, think just think about it. I mean, did you have more fun in this than Texas Chainsaw Massacre? I did. Uh, wow. What did I, I had more the, fun than, in what this did I give, than – What did I give that? I don't know. Four, you gave it fun. better than this. I think we both gave it a five. And I had more fun in this than I did in My Bloody Valentine. I don't remember the remake, so I couldn't tell you. I just um, know being very upset with it. <laughs> So that's it's some somewhat of a comparison to some of the other remakes that we've watched in that I I think it does the slasher films better than those ones. I mean I just I don't find it fun. Hmm. Yeah, I, I mean I, I I think it totally misses misses the mark. At least Texas Chainsaw Massacre like hits the mark on what you'd expect from the the film. Like the the series itself. I don't think this does. I think this totally misses misses the mark. Hmm. Well, so we just disagree. That's fine. It's not fine. I'm okay with that. It's right or 
It's no, right or probably right. Probably viewer v- listeners like to hear that more that we disagree rather than just saying the same <laughs> same rating over and over. See, we don't just say the same rating and and make it like Blood and Black Rum podcast always agrees with each other. We don't always agree with each other. So yeah. Uh, anything else you want to add about Friday Thirteenth? Um, I hope I never. Have I, to I hope you guys have a good Friday Thirteenth. I hope I never have to watch this again. I uh, yeah. I hope. Um, Jason doesn't come for you. I hope you don't run into a black cat or break a mirror or walk I'm under a ladder. Sure I think Jason X is better. I'm, I'm oh, like, I, like I think you will learn to regret that when we watch Jason X. I've seen it before. I've seen I like, mean, again, when we watch it again and you compare them, I think you will I've, find that Jason X is like, a what? lot worse. I've seen it like five times. I think Jason X is a lot worse. What's not to like? About I Jason I don't space. like Jason X. I. I uh, watched it for the first time a few years ago, and I was like, what the fuck is this? This is so... I found it boring and annoying and pretty much every uh, bad adjective. (laughs) I'm not a fan. So, Jason Takes Manhattan. I like Jason Takes Manhattan. I think that's a fun movie. He's not in Manhattan. Huh? He's not in Manhattan, though. He's on a boat. He does go to Manhattan for a little. I just like when he just well, the, smashes the boombox. That's the best part of the whole. I know film. it is. Think, well, that one in the think, rooftop kung yeah, fu scene. I think everyone agrees that those are the two. But yeah. they should have just made it like Jason. Jason's on the love boat. And just have like the, lo- the love boat and have like you know and then have like and like and and also starring Jason Voorhees. Like, no, to be honest with you, I think that Jason Takes Manhattan is a fun film just because of how it changed up the formula a little bit. Uh, Jason Seven's pretty fun because it has that supernatural aspect to it of the the psychic bil- abilities, a little bit different. <laughs> so, I don't know. I like I like that. Even though they're, I wouldn't say they're particularly good films. Um, I think they're at least fun. In the same, I guess you would say that in the same way that Halloween Resurrection is fun, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, um, H two O is not fun. You know, I was actually um, online and I was seeing a lot of people who think that a Halloween H two O is a good Halloween film. Oh wow! I would absolutely disagree. Not we only, reviewed that. We not, rev- <laughs> yeah, I know we did it on the podcast. Not only do I not think it's a good Halloween series film, it's a I also n- don't think it's a good Halloween film. It doesn't have Halloween in it like whatsoever. I mean, there's only like a couple scenes where there's actually. Halloween decorations and or Halloween pumpkins. It's or, a fucking miserable 90s slasher yeah, film. And Josh Hartnett has bad hair. Well, he had terrible hair and yeah. fucking the, the faculty, faculty too. Well. But, Somebody... Fam- but Famke Jansen was still like, I'll sit on your face. <laughs> yeah. Well, you'll take it. I guess he will take it. <laughs> Who would not take that? I don't know. Gay or straight, you say yes, you ma'am. Say, you say yes. You say thank you. And God bless America. <laughs> All right, so uh, next week, I think we are doing Friday. Nightmare on Elm Street, yeah. the remake, um, because we're cu- we're while we we still got a couple weeks left. We've got three episodes more, I, th- I believe. We got next week, we got the week after, and we got a special Halloween episode, possibly a fourth, possibly if we're feeling ambitious and rambunctious. No promises. Last yeah. time I promised Death Wish, it was wrong. Yeah, we don't want to promise anything. But but we we've got a few more episodes left of Remake a Ween. Um we are we're doing a Nightmare on Elm Street remake next week. Um and it, it should be a blast cuz you haven't seen it, right? Nope. And it's not uh, I, I think we're going to I think we're going to have much the same uh animated talk as we had for this episode. Yeah, no, you know what? I can kind of, here here's an e- early preview. I'll probably think it's total trash, and you're like, I thought it was trash, but now I think it's kind of fun, because the spirit of the leaves are with me. If I had to guess, I'm going to say that you think it's trash, and I'm also going to think it's trash. I don't think my opinion's going to change very much, but oh. <laughs> it'll be interesting to see. Again, that's one I've only seen one time, came out of the theater, did a, really hated it, and uh, that was it. So. Yeah, well, that's how you, again... With fri- the yeah, one we just did right now. You, possible. Yeah. Maybe I'll maybe I'll find a newfound uh, you'll fascination be like, with it. You'll be like, I can, I will never imagine Robert England as <laughs> Freddy ever again. No, I wouldn't say a five point five for uh, this Friday the Thirteenth is a good score. So take that as you, I mean, as it, you will. It is for the franchise. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I mean, <laughs> well, that's just. 
It's my humble opinion. All right, so uh, we will be back next week with Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, make sure that you tune in to us on iTunes. Subscribe and leave us a nice review. You can also find us on Stitcher and pretty much any other podcast app that you use or you use to listen to this episode today. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, and we're also on Twitter, at Blood and Black Rum, with an N. And uh, let us know what you think about the show by emailing us at Blood and Black Rum Podcast at gmail.com. You can give us suggestions for n- new episodes. You can just tell us what you think or what you don't like, uh, and we'll respond to them. And check out Coltsploitation.com. Yep, Coltsploitation.com as well, where we uh, are hosted for our, our podcast network, the Coltsploitation Podcast Network. And reach out to them if you are interested in joining the podcast network as well, because we're always open for new cult film podcasts. So check that out. And uh, we also have a Patreon page, patreon.com slash blood and black rum podcast. You can donate to the show. Um, it's a monthly donation. So just keep that in mind when you're putting that in. But uh, there's some cool goodies on there for you if you do donate. And uh, we appreciate anything you can give back to us. One last thing. Your quiz. Yep. Um, there is a quiz up online now on com, And it is a Halloween themed quiz. It's a pretty tough quiz, I would say. Uh, it's based on um, guessing the Halloween film from an image that I give you. And it's 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 difficult, especially if you haven't seen some of the films. or And some of the, the uh, images are pretty obscure from the film. So it's not really obvious what the film really is. It's not, your, it's not a buzz, BuzzFeed no, quiz. No, it, it's not meant to be easy. Uh, if you take it, you can win a Coltsploitation t-shirt if you do well. Either by getting all of them correct, which... So far, we have not had anybody get all of them correct or being the the one person who gets them the most correct. So uh, take that online at coldsploitation.com. It's a fun little quiz and definitely will get you in the Halloween mood. Thank you for listening. Check us out next week when we're back with Remake of Ween with a Nightmare on Elm Street remake. Uh, it should be a fun time. And then we're heading straight to Halloween with a few more episodes of the Remake of Ween series. So uh, keep listening. We appreciate everything that you uh, you do for us. And take care. <laughs>